I'm subscribed to Philosophy Tube, run by a pleasant young man named Ollie. And if you're interested in intelligent, well informed, well researched commentary on a range of philosophical, economic, social, political, and ethical issues, I suggest you subscribe too. I don't always agree with him, and sometimes I watch his videos knowing I'm going to disagree, but I watch them anyway because it's important to listen to thoughtful, carefully reasoned critiques of your personal views. It helps keep you intellectually honest, and you can learn from it even if you still disagree. Philosophy Tube published a video entitled African Philosophy and the Enlightenment. It's only about 11 minutes long, and you really should watch it before you finish watching this response. Please note that this video is not a takedown or rebuttal or even challenge to Ollie's original video. It's a critical response aimed at presenting an alternative, though not completely different, perspective. I'm going to point out some facts which I think contradict some of his conclusions, some facts which I think weaken some of his arguments, and some facts which I think not only support some of his arguments, but actually make them even stronger. There's a lot to cover, so I'll be releasing this response in four parts once a week. Ollie's video is about a 17th century Ethiopian philosopher called Zira Yaqob, whose philosophy was remarkable for his time and place. Jacob's life and philosophy have been studied for a very long time in his homeland of Ethiopia and for many decades in the West. The first scholarly edition of Jacob's work in English was published in 1976 by Professor Claude Sommer, and this is the translation I use. We should consider a few facts about Jacob's background and general attitude in order to appreciate the context of his writings. Jacob tells us that he spent 10 years at a school, quote, to study the interpretation of the Holy Scriptures, end quote. He tells us he learned the interpretations of both foreign Catholic scholars and the interpretations of Ethiopian Coptic scholars. This means Jacob would have had a comprehensive knowledge of earlier Christian thought and commentary on the Bible. He would certainly have been familiar with the writings of famous and influential early Christian writers and leaders who were born in North Africa, such as Tertullian and Cyprian in Carthage, Cyril, Oregon and Athanasius in Alexandria of Egypt, and Augustine in Numidia. Jacob's personal approach to understanding God and nature was deeply influenced by these sources, and even though he made great efforts to scrutinize critically the Christian teachings he had learned and explicitly rejected some of them, it is still possible to detect a Christian foundation in his thoughts, and even some of the conclusions he represents as his original thought can be found in the writings of earlier Christian scholars he would have read and studied. In addition to Jacob's intellectual context, we must also take into account his socio-cultural context. As a 17th century Ethiopian, his attitude toward other ethnic groups and nations would have been shaped by the fact that Ethiopia was a powerful and successful nation with an empire which had conquered several kingdoms. The language he uses demonstrates a strong ethnocentrism in which his own nation and culture has pride of place. Jacob refers to Ethiopians as us and we, while referring to all non-Ethiopians as Frang, a word in the Gez language of Ethiopia which simply means foreigner. Even when speaking of the Portuguese, who were allies of Ethiopia and regular visitors, Jacob does not differentiate them from any other ethnic group, even though he knows they are different. For Jacob, all non-Ethiopians are simply foreigners, and there is no need to differentiate them any further because they are defined specifically by what they have in common. They are not Ethiopian. This language, which treats one ethnic group as the norm and all others as undifferentiated others, reflects a sense of superiority and grants a special status to one's own ethnic group. Such terminology has a long history and can be found in most ethnic groups. The Greeks referred to all non-Greeks as barbaroi, literally barbarians, and in Europe such othering terminology was common for centuries, especially of non-white people, although it is strongly discouraged now. In the Far East, reference to people outside one's ethnic group with a word meaning foreigner is still common in nations such as Korea, Waiguk Saram, or Uyghurin, Japan, Gaijin, and China, Waiguoren. Little or no effort is made to differentiate between ethnic groups which are outside their own because they do not feel it is important to do so. These people are simply foreigners. All this helps establish Jacob in his time and place. By identifying the views he had in common with people of his own immediate context, 
it is easier to detect just how differently, and even radically, he came to disagree with them. Now let's see what Oli says about Jacob. We're going to be learning about a philosopher called Zira Jacob, who came up with a lot of the ideas that we attribute to the European Enlightenment way before anybody else. Oli actually only mentions a few ideas that Jacob came up with, not a lot of ideas. Additionally, later we'll see that Jacob didn't come up with these ideas way before anybody else. But this is a catchy hook for the start of Oli's video, and I think a little enthusiastic exaggeration is forgivable in this context. He mentions that the Europeans colonising Africa were using their religion to cloak their theft as an example of how it's important to think critically about what people tell you. Oli doesn't provide a citation, so I'm not sure which part of Jacob's treatise he's referring to. I read it through a few times and I couldn't find anything which seemed to say this. In chapter 1, Jacob mentions, quote, a great persecution, end quote, which he says, quote, spread all over Ethiopia, end quote. However, he does not attribute this persecution to the Europeans. Instead, he tells us it was the work of the Ethiopian king who had converted to Roman Catholic Christianity and was persecuting Ethiopian non-Catholics, including other Christians who were not Catholic. In chapter 3, Jacob mentions a slightly later time when the Portuguese were also persecuting the local people, but he never actually talks about Europeans colonising Africa, nor does he say they were using religion to cloak their theft. In fact, for Jacob, conflict between the Ethiopians and the Europeans, which for Jacob typically means the Portuguese, is always a religious conflict between two competing Christian groups, Catholics and non-Catholics. Additionally, although Jacob tells us that at this time the Portuguese were, quote, strong in their persecution, end quote, he also tells us that, quote, my own people were even worse than they, end quote. There's a reason why this is an important point to dwell on. Many of us would assume that a 17th century African nation would necessarily have been less powerful and less influential than a European nation of the same era, and would therefore expect that Jacob and his fellow Ethiopians had been subordinated by the Portuguese. However, this assumption would be very misguided. It is not true that African nations have always been subject to European conquest and colonization. In fact, at various times in history, African nations, especially those in North Africa, were sufficiently powerful to raise empires and invade Europe, doing some conquering and colonizing of their own. Even leaving aside the Egyptian Empire, one of the largest and most powerful of the ancient world, the Carthaginians of North Africa not only built their own empire, but attacked both the Greeks and the Romans, even invading and conquering nearly all of Sicily. The Berber people of North Africa, later known as the Moors, conquered territory as far south as the Sahara and invaded Europe repeatedly, conquering the entire Iberian Peninsula, now part of Spain, as well as Sicily. So, perhaps contrary to our expectation, Jacob does not characterise the relationship between the Portuguese and the Ethiopians as the brutal conquest and subjugation of a weak and subordinate African nation by a stronger, dominant and exploitative European power. One reason for this is that the Portuguese did not actually conquer the country or overthrow the Ethiopian monarchy. On occasion they lent their military support to Ethiopian rulers, but they never invaded Ethiopia and they were never in a position of power over the nation. Another reason why Jacob would not have seen the relationship between the Portuguese and Ethiopia as a power disparity in favour of Portugal is that at this time Ethiopia itself was an imperial power. Over centuries, the Ethiopian Empire had conquered several local kingdoms and brought many tribes under its rule. During the 15th century, it sent diplomatic envoys to Europe and became allied with Portugal. During Jacob's lifetime, he would have seen the Ethiopian Emperor Facilides demonstrate his dominance over the Europeans by re-establishing Coptic Christianity as the national religion, instead of Catholic Christianity, and commanding all Europeans to leave Ethiopia. Jacob would therefore have viewed the Portuguese as social and political equals, not as imperial colonizers. Professor Chike Jeffers, who specializes in Africana philosophy, says, quote, Zero Jacob's experience of Europeans was an experience of powerful outsiders, but not of conquering or would-be conquering subjugators, end quote. In fact, Ethiopia was never conquered or colonized by any European nation, 
and remained one of the few African nations which maintained its own independence during the repeated invasions of Africa by European countries in the late 19th century, the so-called Scramble for Africa. In part two of this series, we will look at Jacob in the context of the Enlightenment philosophers to which Oli compares him, and we'll see what he shared with them and how he disagreed. <laughs>